Welcome back everyone. I'm Taylor Cauldron, the Director of Organic Search here at Climb Marketing. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about the upcoming Core Web Vitals update that Google's rolling out in May of 2021. We're going to be talking about it in language that kind of anyone can understand because unfortunately a lot of Google's documentation is basically oriented towards developers. And while developers might be the most important audience for this, the reality is that this Google update is going to affect basically everyone in the marketing community and so we all need to have at least some basic understanding of what's involved. So in this video, we'll be covering a few different things. We'll start off by defining what the core web vitals are and what to expect from the algorithm update. We'll talk a little bit about what are sort of the common stumbling blocks that websites face in getting aligned with Google's new expectations. And also what we personally expect the algorithm will evolve over time to look like. Because ultimately, while it's gonna roll out in one certain state in May of 2021, it's not gonna stay that way. Google's even said that they kind of plan on updating these annually. So having some sense of the direction that we think this will evolve in will be useful for making long-term plans. The easiest way to think about the core web vitals in their current state is as a set of three metrics that Google is going to be using to approximate the quality of user experience offered by a website. In May of 2021, they're going to incorporate these measurements into their ranking algorithm, which means that websites that offer a good experience will rank higher and websites that unfortunately don't will generally rank lower. Google's also considering adding in some sort of badge or check mark to the search engine results pages themselves to indicate what users can expect from a website. So this is going to be important both for your rankings and also possibly for your click-through rate. And Google has said that they've actually seen a 70% increase in the usage of the tools that they use to measure these different benchmarks, which means that a lot of developers and marketing managers out there are already either checking the status of their website or actively taking action to improve their websites in order to get ready for this May 2021 update. Now, we don't know exactly the magnitude magnitude that this update is going to have when it first rolls out in May of 2021. The information that we have at this point is essentially what is Google going to be measuring and what are the threshold benchmarks it's setting as kind of a good passing score. So let's dig into each of these now. So the first of the three core web vitals is called Largest Contentful Paint, or LCP for short. What LCP is intended to approximate is essentially the loading time of a page. Now, what Google is actually measuring to do this is how long it takes for the largest element on a page to fully appear and render for the user. And it's only looking at things that are above the fold, so to speak. So anything that a user would have to scroll down to see, whether it's on a desktop or on a cell phone, doesn't really matter for this metric. It's the largest element in terms of screen size that appears above the fold. Most commonly, this will be an image, like a banner image, or it'll be a block of text. Now, there are some sort of nitty-gritty technical details about how LCP gets calculated in some fringe cases. We're not going to go into those. We'll have a link to Google's developer documentation below, so if you find yourself in a situation where you're in one of these edge cases, you can refer to that. But what everyone needs to know about LCP, and of course the other core web vitals, is what is a passing score, and how often do you need to have a passing score? The answer for LCP is that the largest element above the fold needs to load in two seconds or less. And this needs to be the case 75% of the time that a user visits one of your web pages. It's important to keep in mind that Google is measuring sort of real human interactions with your website for these benchmarks, not measuring it in a lab using, you know, sort of a, a robot or a script. Uh, and so what that means is that, you know, if most of the visitors to your website are on mobile, that's going to be a little bit trickier because things tend to load a little bit more slowly on mobile devices. And so you'll have to be a little bit more aggressive with your optimization of LCP. It also means that pages on your website that are more frequently visited are disproportionately important. So for instance, your homepage really needs to load as fast as possible uh, in order to achieve a good two second or less score for this 75% of the time or more. So at this point, you're probably wondering how your own website is faring in terms of LCP. And there's a few different ways to find out. The best of these is to go directly to Google Search Console and look at the data that is there, because that is real-world human data, which is the kind of data that Google is going to be using uh, when they're sort of measuring up your website. But if you can't do that, for instance, if your website isn't launched yet so you don't have that data, or maybe you just don't have enough traffic on a regular basis to get a meaningful result from that, there's a few other ways that you can go about it. 
The simplest of these is to use Google's PageSpeed Insights tool, which you just plug in a URL, it'll take a few seconds to kind of process the page, uh, and then it will give you a preliminary result. Uh, and of course, this is a laboratory result, and while it will strongly correlate with real-world human experiences, it won't be exactly the same. But still, it's going to be good enough in 99% of cases. It's also worth mentioning, if you get to the point where both Google Search Console and PageSpeed Insights aren't giving you the sort of granular information you need in order to fix your website, the best next place to go is Chrome's DevTools. It's a set of sort of developer-centric tools for laying out exactly what's happening when a page is loading. And this is really where you'll get the, the sort of nitty-gritty technical details that a developer would need in order to make an improvement in order to fix LCP and many of these other core web vitals. So the next metric we're going to talk about is called First Input Delay, or FID for short. FID is intended to reward websites that offer a good user experience in terms of sort of the response time after a user enters input into the page, which could just be a click or entering a keystroke in a search field or something like that. And what Google's actually measuring with this is the time between the event, so the click or the keystroke, and how long it takes for the page to start processing it. So it's a little bit different than the actual time it takes for the page to visually respond to it. It's just how long it takes for the page to start thinking about what exactly it needs to do with that data. Now, in our experience, this is usually the rarest uh, core web vital for a website to have a problem with. It's only really an issue in our experience for websites that have kind of a lot of processing going on in the background on the page. So for instance, if you have a WordPress site that has a ton of plugins installed that are always kind of doing something in the background, either measuring user behavior or maybe they're loading up some sort of applet that appears further down on the screen, if those aren't pausing on a regular basis to kind of check for user input, you might have a problem with FID. But like I said, chances are you're more likely to run into an issue with either LCP or CLS, which is going to be the next one we're talking about, than with FID. It's a little bit more rare to have an issue with this. One important thing to mention about FID is that while you can get FID data from Google Search Console, you're not going to be able to get it from PageSpeed Insights. It's not a metric that can be sort of measured in the lab, so to speak, by a robot. It's, it sort of relies on human interaction with a page, therefore you have to have that real-world data in order to get that measurement. That being said, there is sort of a proxy measurement that you can use. So if you're in PageSpeed Insights and you see total blocking time, that very, very strongly correlates with first input delay. So if you are trying to, uh, you know, make some changes to your website and, you know, after every change you make, see how FID is going to change, uh, you don't really have to wait on more user data to come in. You can use total blocking time in PageSpeed Insights in order to approximate the improvement that you're making for that metric. So what's sort of the goal metric for FID? The answer is 100 milliseconds or less. So 100 milliseconds or less between the time that a user enters data, like does it click, and the time it takes for the browser to start processing that event. So it should be pretty easy to hit in most situations unless there's a ton of scripts running on your website. So the third core web vital is called Cumulative Layout Shift, or CLS. And it's meant to promote websites that have good visual stability. So visual stability essentially refers to uh, the quality of a website where nothing about the layout shifts unexpectedly without some sort of user interaction. So if you've ever been on a website where maybe you go to click a button, but at the last millisecond before you click it, all of a sudden the layout changes and you click the wrong button, and it's super aggravating, Google's trying to avoid those situations by promoting websites that have good visual stability. So in order to succeed for this metric, basically what it means is you can't have the layout of your page kind of change of its own volition. It can only change the layout in response to user interaction. So the goal for this metric is to hit 0.1 or less cumulative layout shift. So what does that mean? So obviously cumulative layout shift is the sum total of any layout shifts, plural, that happen on the page. It might be only one massive shift that happens or it might be lots of little ones that happen. And so how, do the, how is the score calculated for each individual layout shift? Well, it's pretty simple. It's the percentage of the page that gets moved multiplied by what percentage of the page it moves. So it's basically just like its area times the distance moved. So if you have, uh, you know, your entire page, you know, 100% of your page moves 10% down, then that's the 0.1 right there and you're just on the edge of failing this metric. On the other hand, if it's some small button that moves a little bit down the page, 
you're probably going to be fine. But what you want to avoid are two situations. Either A, you know, the entire page gets shifted down by some new element loading or unexpectedly appearing, uh, or a situation where there's an individual element that, you know, is 10% of the page or greater, you know, getting entirely pushed, you know, below the fold and just disappearing entirely. Those are two situations where you'll basically instantly fail this benchmark. Uh, on the other hand, if it's a slight shift that happens, it's probably not going to be a deal breaker for this. So something I want to point out with CLS is that we're always dealing in terms of percentages rather than in terms of pixels. And what this means is that if most of your users are on a mobile device where the screen size is very small, it's very easy for half the screen on a mobile device to move slightly compared to say on a desktop. You know, very, very small changes on a desktop can sometimes be kind of magnified when we're talking about percentage of the screen on a mobile device. So if most of your users are on mobile devices, you really need to pay close attention to cumulative layout shift because if you make a very small change that seems insignificant on a desktop device, on a mobile device, it could be the difference between passing and failing for this metric. All right, so how do we measure CLS for your website? Well, there's a couple of ways. It's pretty similar to Largest Contentful Paint where you can either just go directly to Google Search Console and get real world human data, or you can go to PageSpeed Insights and get the sum total of all the layout shifts there. It'll just be labeled CLS. So that's pretty easy. If you're in a situation where the CLS seems really high and you have no idea what's causing it, that's when, of course, you'll need to crack open Chrome's dev tools where you can actually see all of the individual layout shifts that add up to that cumulative layout shift. So that's the current state of the core web vitals and how they should look when they affect the algorithm starting in May of 2021. Google has said these will change over time. They've stated that it'll happen on a predictable annual basis. Whether or not we can believe them on this is a different question. You know, Google frequently makes unannounced changes uh, or they'll overemphasize some things and underemphasize others. So I don't want to say take it with a grain of salt, but keep in mind that I wouldn't be surprised if these changes happened more often than annually and maybe without much advance notice. So what do we expect the rollout of this algorithm update to look like and how it's going to evolve over time? I personally feel that when it first hits in May 2021, the impact on rankings is going to be fairly small and then they're going to ramp it up more over time. I also think that pretty rapidly Google's going to start to incorporate additional measurements in the core web vitals. Like for instance, I think it's very likely Google will start to measure things like the total amount of data being transferred in order to load a web page because largest contentful paint, to be honest, doesn't do the best job approximating the real human experience of a page loading. Uh, you know, there are lots of situations where the largest element on a page isn't in fact the most important element. Uh, and so this is kind of a bad measurement of real user experience in my opinion. And I think it will need to get supplemented by an additional measurement in order to make sure it genuinely reflects the real human experience of a website. I also think that Google is going to start to incorporate more accessibility related metrics into their core web vitals. So things like the, uh, the contrast of text over images, uh, whether images have uh, alt text that can be used by screen readers. These are things that are very, very easy to measure about a web page. Uh, and I think over time, Google will start to incorporate that more into its ranking algorithms and will probably do it within the context of the core web vitals. We recently published a blog post that deals with it in a little bit more detail. We're also gonna have a podcast episode coming up where we chat about this a little bit. If you wanna learn more after that, of course, you know, there is always Google's documentation. While it is a little bit more technical, there's nothing like hearing it straight from the source. So I would encourage you to also look through that. Of course, if after all of this, you're still feeling lost or confused or just anxious about, you know, how your website is scoring, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You know, ever since this was announced, we've been basically looking at it every single day. So we feel pretty confident that we can help out almost any website on the planet, uh, you know, rank a little bit better, uh, especially when it comes to these core web vitals. You know, in the case of our website, uh, I, I've been kind of tinkering around with some of the pages, figuring out how I can get these scores as good as possible. And I was able to get uh, you know, a PageSpeed Insight score of 98%, uh, at least on the desktop version, for one of our pages just by making a few really simple changes to the code. So if you need that kind of help, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You know, we're really here for you. So that is it for today. You know, if you found this video helpful, useful, uh, you know, I appreciate the thumbs up thing. It just helps kind of YouTube's algorithm recommend us to more people. Uh, if you want to keep your finger on the pulse of other things that are happening in digital marketing, you know, I really recommend subscribing to this channel because there's gonna be more episodes like this coming up soon. Thank you.